All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining the Innovative Solar webinar series, Investing in Your Energy Future. Um, today's topic is going to be how to smooth over speed bumps of solar project financing. Uh, my name is Nathan Vogel. I'm the Senior Vice President of Market Development and Customer Engagement here at Innovative Solar. And um, I'll be uh, the moderator here today. And we're going to give people a few more minutes to join here. I know some people just got kicked out and we've got a lot more people that we're admitting into the webinar. So bear with us here for a few minutes and, and we'll get started. We've got a few more join in here. Hello again, and welcome to uh, the Innovative Solar Webinar Series, Investing in Your Energy Future. We're gonna get started here. Um, today's topic is how to smooth over speed bumps of solar project financing. And this webinar is brought to you by Brilliant Capital and Innovative Solar. My name is Nathan Vogel. I'm uh, the Senior Vice President of Market Development and Customer Engagement here at Innovative Solar. And I've been with the company since 2005. And I'll be the moderator here today. We've got uh, Danny Nussbaum from Innovative Solar, who's the Vice President of Project Development. And we've got Chris Malkar, who's the President of Brilliant Capital, speaking today. Um, thanks for joining us, guys. Danny, my first question is for you. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Innovative Solar and about your role at Innovative? Sure. Thanks, Nathan. And uh, thank you to everybody who joined today. Um, again, my name is Danny Nussbaum. I'm our Vice President of Project Development here at Innovative Solar. Um, Innovative Solar is a, a EPC and developer in South Bend, Indiana, that has been around for um, about 15 years. And, um, you know, our key has been trying to answer the questions of how people can implement strategies to better invest in their energy solutions. And um, really it started out um, in 2005 with uh, our, our, our founders, the Kandrzejewski family and Howard family, getting together to look at different uh, renewable energy solutions. And around 2008 decided um, that solar was going to be a, a pivotal role to, to play in what they focused their energy on. And so over the last 12 years, really what we've tried to do is look at the needs of the energy marketplace and answer questions um, for those needs. And so it started out really as a, a, a supply distribution company uh, and, and morphed as and grew as, as the needs in that energy marketplace um, needed to be addressed. So it meant um, bringing on engineering capabilities, construction management capabilities, as well as um, an ability to do project management and really um, implement a strategy in the field to deliver on um, these products. 
And, um, you know, all throughout that process, we noticed that there was certainly an element of a discussion with finance. And that might be uh, related to the capital that a company is able to allocate themselves to own it, but also us being able to present solutions um, to them to incorporate other mechanisms to, to pay for these um, solar arrays. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, we've really tried to do is learn about the clients that we've worked with and that we're targeting and find out what those needs are and then be able to answer to that process. And, and one of the things we found over the years was that that financing element um, is a pivotal role. And uh, we've been able to partner with a lot of great folks throughout the process. Um, and, but at times there were, we weren't fully in control of that process and, and didn't have a, a stable answer for our metric. And so there was always this question in our minds of, of whether or not we could come up with that financing solution. So over the last few years, as, as we've worked through projects with some of the, the uh, logos and brands that you've seen with these companies, um, we've been able to, to address that issue by coming up with a partnership here that we're going to discuss today with, with Brilliant Capital. And so, um, you know, we're, we're certainly excited to talk about um, what those next steps look like and, and how this better suits us to fit and, um, and, and be an answer for folks in the marketplace. And um, so, you know, that's part of what we're going to focus on today is how that all works, um, how Innovatus plays a role and, and how we can make it easier. And then um, Chris can certainly talk to the elements of, of Brilliant Capital, how it's, how it's put together and how we can provide solutions for, for folks that might be on the call. Great, thanks, Danny. Um, I wanted to remind everybody before I get to Chris that if you have any questions to please put them in the chat, you can have them sent directly to me, Nathan Vogel, or to the general group, and we'll get to the questions at the end of the presentation. Okay, next we have uh, Chris Malkar, who's the president of Brilliant Capital. Chris, thanks for joining us. Um, Chris, can you tell us a little bit more about Brilliant Capital, who's involved with Brilliant Capital, what it is and how it works? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Danny. And uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, taken time out of their busy December to uh, spend a little bit of time with us uh, on this webinar. I know it's uh, the busy time of the year for a lot of people. So as Danny alluded to, uh, Brilliant Capital was created by the ownership group at Innovatus really in response to uh, customer needs. So we do feel like uh, by adding this service, we can better serve our customers. Uh, we have three entities that are owners of Brilliant Capital. The first is Middleburg Capital Development, uh, which is uh, founded and run by Tim and David Sutherland in a previous life. Um, you know, Tim founded and was the chairman and CEO of Pace Global Energy Services which was sold uh, about 10 years ago to Siemens. Uh, they have you know, a wealth of knowledge in the industry uh, and specialize in, in private placements. Um, our other uh, owner is the Logican Group, which is a diversified family wealth fund uh, with a track record of investing in solar projects and they have an appetite to expand their, uh, their portfolio. And then our third owner we should note is Innovative Solar. Innovative does have a minority interest in Brilliant Capital. Um, I should also note that, you know, along with the, uh, the owners of those entities, we have two other notable board members. One is former Senator um, Joe Donnelly from Indiana and Gary Jago, who is, I'm sorry, not Gary Jago, uh, Gary Lehman, who is a uh, prominent businessman with a lot of ties uh, industry in, in Indiana and throughout the Midwest. So our mission, uh, there are a lot of words here, but you can really think about it in three elements. So primarily we exist to invest money into good solar projects. And then the second you know, reason for our existence is to support the growth and operations of Innovatus and Innovatus as customers. So we only invest in projects where Innovatus has a role either in the development services element or in you know, engineering procurement or construction. And then the final element of our mission is to be a good uh, partner to our communities, to our business partners, to our customers. We, we take that very seriously. Relationships are, are of the utmost importance to us. Uh, in terms of what we're interested in investing in, so Brilliant Capital will uh, de deploy money at any stage in the development cycle of a solar project. So we'll go you know, from 
very early stage where land hasn't been uh, secured yet all the way to NTP um, or notice to proceed for construction. You know, typically we're, we're not interested in buying projects that are already operational you know, because, you know, we are interested in bringing business to Innovatus. Um, we're a relatively small fund compared to a lot of the funds that are out there. Um, so for development investments and for smaller projects, we generally finance those in-house and we have uh, both tax equity and sponsor equity. But for larger projects and larger portfolios of projects, we, um, you know, we look to partner with, uh, with, with larger institutions. And this slide here has kind of uh, the highlights of uh, some of our favorite financial institutions. If we've left anyone out, it's not intentional. Don't, don't be upset. We're, you know, looking to expand the relationships. We've, had very successful projects with these uh, six companies in the past, and you know we're excited to do more business with them in the future. Uh, and then, oh, if you go back one, this last slide is really our secret sauce, I would say. So, you know, as an investor in a very competitive marketplace, you know we feel like we have a strategic advantage because we can rely so heavily on the expertise across the hall at Innovatus. You know, we really do believe that uh, they are the, you know, the number one EPC firm in the Midwest, if not the country. Uh, and in the last couple of years, they've uh, expanded their capabilities to, to dev uh, provide development services as well. So when we make investments, we're really leaning on their expertise. So we have, you know, complete confidence that our money is being deployed into good projects. And then beyond that, <clears throat> because of the um, you know, the overlap of ownership between Innovatus and Brilliant Capital, we can uh, really avoid some of the speed bumps associated with due diligence and contracting. So, for instance, you know, we, in projects that we invest in, we don't typically hire a uh, independent engineer because, frankly, we, we trust the uh, expertise of the engineers at, at Innovatus, you know, more than we would an independent consultant. Um, so that saves, you know, $20,000 or more per project and, and also the time and effort required to kind of sh to shepherd that process. And then additionally, in terms of contracting, when we're looking at uh, the terms and conditions of an EPC contract or an O&M contract, you know, we don't spend a lot of time or legal fees uh, going back and forth on liquidated damages or, or indemnity provisions because we know that the interests of both, you know, the EPC firm and the investment firm are already aligned. So any issues that come up will be cured and, and uh, everyone is motivated in the same direction. Um, and I, I don't know if we talked about this earlier, but Innovatus does also provide O&M services. So that, that same benefit goes from you know, development through contracting and, uh, and into operations. So that's the secret sauce in a nutshell. Maybe at this point, uh, Danny, it makes sense to kind of dive into the um, you know, the nitty gritty of, um, you know, project development and what roadblocks we typically see developers or customers encounter when they're uh, trying to develop solar projects. Sure. So uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah. I, I mean, again, to, to kind of take a step back and, and talk about Innovate's experience in the, in the marketplace. So um, towards the end of this year, we'll be approaching um, 500 megawatts of of solar that's been delivered to the marketplace. And that's really come in all different shapes and sizes. Like I said before, we've, we've expanded our team. We, we now have um, over 335 years of experience between all the team members. And um, you know, those projects have come about in a lot of different ways. Some of them have been uh, organic uh, developments where we went out um, ourselves and, and acquired the land and went through that process and went through land options and, and uh, the process of figuring out interconnections and making sure that we had an off taker. An example of, of some of that would be this Kokomo Solar project we're highlighting here it was a Duke RFP that we um, were able to, to work on the, the land execution side from scratch uh, and bring a project. And then um, on, on the back end, there's a minority ownership stake as well. Um, but all throughout that process, there's certainly an element of financing. And so you know, the ability to be able to rely on partners to execute um, what you need to do to, as far as land options are considered, as far as 
um, the studying and geotech and some of those things that all flow into the ability to look at a project and, and designate whether or not it can be brought to the finish line is an important process. And so, you know, we've identified a couple of different subsets where Brilliant Capital will have uh, the ability to, to fund that process, as well as partner with folks. We certainly have um, folks, and I'm sure um, quite a few of you are on the call that we've talked to in the past that we certainly look forward to combining in those efforts to, to bring projects of all different shapes and sizes to the, to the marketplace. And so I think the value set that we're bringing here is uh, seamless communication between the, the Innovatives team and the Brilliant Capital team. And if you, if you were to choose to bring us on as a partner, uh, things would, would flow um, quickly and, and smoothly so that we were all on the same page to mitigate risk throughout that process. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just add that, um, you know, from the financing perspective, you know, we consider a project to be early stage until you've completed, you know, the following four elements, I'd say. So number one, you need to identify who the off taker is going to be, who's going to buy the power. Number two, you need to identify where that project is going to be located, whether it's on a roof or on a field somewhere. Third element is, you know, have you completed the preliminary engineering and design. And along with that, do you have you know, clear visibility uh, into the interconnection process and, and some sense of what the cost will be? And the fourth element is, have you done a preliminary economic analysis to be sure that you know, either the project will save you money, um, does it make sense for, for the customer to own the project or would, would the customer prefer a PPA? So within those four, you know, those four key, um, you know, elements of project development. If you're the customer, if, if you are a business or a school or, or even a small municipality or utility, typically you can be relatively confident that you've got two of those four boxes checked, right? Like, you know that you'll be buying the power and you probably know where you want to place the facility, be it on the rooftop or some uh, piece of property that you own. And then you need help finding the other two elements right so as you're looking for you know really it's a it's a feasibility analysis will will the project work you know, innovatus will provide preliminary uh design and engineering for you really at no cost at part as as part of our um you know typical business development activities right that's how you know we generate business we you know, I think we're uh, kind of distinct in the marketplace and that we spend a lot of time educating our customers and we're happy to, 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 to spend those hours um, you know, doing the early stage development work. And the other element is the economic feasibility. And Brilliant Capital is also happy to do that as well, right? We don't, we certainly don't want to put the project uh, to a customer that, that doesn't make sense for the, for the customer. We're looking for, you know, win, win, win. Um, and we're also happy to do that you know, on our, you know, with our own time. So really that's the advantage that Danny is describing is in that you can go to one entity, you know, Brilliant Capital and Innovatus is kind of a combined service offering and get both of those last two pieces um, taken care of uh, in order to get you through the initial fatal flaw analysis. Yeah, another thing that I would add um, in, in the analysis there that that's, currently done is mitigating risks around community engagement with, with boards of zoning approval, um, whether or not there are uh, dynamics of property tax that need to be addressed. Um, you know, our, our team has experience in, in going through that process and talking through the metrics so that um, any of the levers that can be pulled to help or potentially add risk to that financial um, formula can be addressed so that uh, you know, as much risk as possible can be mitigated and talked through throughout that process, just to make sure that nothing sneaks up on investors or um, put something uh, late in the game that would cause a project to fall apart. And so, um, you know, some of that has been just built through experience over the years and uh, learning some of these things the hard way when some, you, you feel like you had an approval on, uh, in one manner and uh, it didn't come to fruition. And, uh, you know, so that's just something that we have a specific checklist that we, we keep in mind and work through all of that uh, in, transparently with uh, Brilliant Capital and any of its partners. Yeah, and that, that really is, you know, from a financing perspective, 
you know, once you kind of move into the later stages of product development, that really is where you see some roadblocks, right? There's always going to be issues at the local level in terms of, uh, you know, navigating the local zoning board, uh, obtaining all the local permits and the federal permits. So, you know, every, every project is different and every uh, municipality is different. Every county is different and every state is different. Uh, so the, the benefit of having an experienced partner to help you navigate those uh, those issues really can't be uh, understated for a financial partner because that is where it, a lot of the uh, you know the headaches really uh, materialize in project development. There are always delays. There's always extra uh, extra costs. There's always a, a a permit that you didn't realize you needed. So having uh, an experienced uh, partner there really does help. And I think that this is one of those elements where a local um, a local partner is important. So, you know, Innovatus has experience, you know, throughout Indiana and, you know, throughout other uh, states in the Midwest as well. We've done work in Ohio, Kansas, Michigan, um, and that's, you know, that's just uh, the Midwestern market. Yeah, Chris, and then there's, there's a, another element here that has been successful in partnership where um, we've been able to partner with folks that have done uh, a lot of that development already, and they're, they're looking for a strong EPC partner and possibly a financing solution as well. And so we, we highlighted some of the names on that list of folks we'd work with. This project that we have listed here, the Elida Schools, is a project that was developed by the Entrust team um, in Ohio, and they, they um, partnered with us on the EPC side and, as well as the, the financing side. And so, um, you know, I think the main message that we're trying to bring across is that it isn't necessarily a cookie cutter standpoint that we are um, looking to come to on how we partner with folks. We like to um, look at the needs, look at, uh, assess the project itself, and then try to come up with a game plan to, to bring it to fruition. Um, we've got a, uh, an in-depth uh, strategy and uh, research department here that has looked at a lot of what's going on. And even through what we've seen this year with COVID, uh, a lot of development has still been able to, to progress. There have been some slowing down of things, but we've certainly noticed that the marketplace is, is healthy and the demand for solar is not going away. Um, but one of those concerns that they've brought up is the ability to have reputable EPC firms that can deliver on that product. And so some folks are, are looking for solutions. And so one of our goals is to continue to partner with folks, build that relationship and then be able to project um, that pipeline moving forward, whether that be from our own development efforts, um, from developers that we partner with, or um, other folks that are looking for uh, just the, the EPC side of things. And so, um, you know, again, it's this continual effort that Innovatus has had from the start to, um, to grow with the marketplace and its demands and being able to have a solid financing um, partnership with Bryant Capital and some of the folks that Brilliant Capital um, works with uh, it certainly helps us to be uh, to feel like we have a stable solution in that marketplace. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with all that, Danny. And I would just add that you know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the one of the bigger roadblocks or or uh, elements that that creates a delay with projects is is getting you know alignment from all the stakeholders. So. You know, financing a solar project really is a lot like herding cats, and you need to get, you know, everyone lined up and and moving in the right direction. And the local community can really uh, either be, you know, a supporter of the project, or they can make it almost impossible to build it, if not if not impossible, but if they don't uh, get behind the project. And I think one of the areas that we place an emphasis, you know, and that we emphasize that other uh, financial institutions may not is our uh, commitment to the community. So we're not in there just looking for you know a good return on our investment. We really are trying to um, to provide a, a benefit to the community. And this project in particular, although I may be misspeaking here, typically when we do projects for schools, you know we'll engage the school board. We uh, provide a um, kind of a slick. Uh, um, display within the school system that shows the output and the performance of the uh, of the solar array. So we create an educational element uh, to really, you know, drive home that the 
the uh, project is benefiting the community, the school, and it and it provides you know an additional interesting uh, educational tool for the local community. So that that type of thing is is uh, something we also take very importantly. Right, and it, yeah, and again, that was certainly um, one of the the goals that was set early on by by the interest team, making sure we communicate with the school, meeting their needs, and trying to follow up to to make sure that we budgeted accordingly and that that things were all in place to deliver on on what was set up by uh, our development partners there. And then the the last slide, Chris mentioned this before on the operation side. So once the once the the array itself is active. Um, you know, we do have solutions and things that we can factor into the financial uh, formula for providing for the O&M services. Um, and you know, feel like we have a skilled team that can uh, approach any solution, whether it's uh, to deal with uh, natural causes or, uh, in this case, a, a semi driving off the road and making contact with the array itself. So, um, you know, all of those different uh, points that we need to make sure that we plan for. Uh, in the financial formula are accounted for with uh, both the innovators team and, and in communication with the brilliant capital team. So Nathan, I'll, yeah, I uh, think... I'll turn it back over to you. I don't know if there's been some, some questions that we can address that on more specifics that have come up in the chat box or um, if there's anything specific that uh, folks want us to pivot to. Yeah, thanks Danny, thanks Chris, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, reminder, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. Um, I did get a few directly uh, to me um, that I can ask here for you guys. And then if, if we do have more questions than we can get to today, uh, we've got Danny and Chris's email addresses here. Feel free to reach out to them with any questions. Or if you think of any after we're done here, feel free to reach out. Um, Okay, one of the questions I have here uh, is to Brilliant Capital, and we actually got two questions pretty similar. Uh, is there a preferred system size for Brilliant Capital or dollar amount? And the other question was, what size project will you finance and up to what amount? Sure. So, you know, our, I'd say our uh, minimum project size is, you know, 500 kW on the Brilliant Capital side. I know that you know, Innovate is, is, is trying to uh, focus on, you know, slightly larger projects. And we have, you know, partners that we work with on the smaller projects. But, um, yeah, anything larger than 500 kW, we are interested in, in looking at. Uh, you know, given our size, anything larger than 5 megawatts, we probably need to bring a partner in to, uh, to support at this point, you know, we're a growing uh, entity, so you know that may change in the coming years. But you know, for now, anything larger than five megawatts, we we will need some some help from our financial partners. I should also note that you know we we provide both sponsor and tax equity, and we can be flexible. So we can, you know, for example, on the Elida project that you just highlighted, we provided just the tax equity. Um, on the Lippert project that was uh, highlighted earlier, we provided both the tax equity and the sponsor. So we're happy to do, you know, either or 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 both. And Nathan, on the innovative side, um, we we are generally targeting uh, projects from an EPC perspective that are a bit larger than that. But we're happy to talk through solutions on projects of any size. So we've got a, a very wide range of experience um, and, and work with folks on projects. And so if if there are folks with um, questions about projects that seem to be smaller than that, still feel free to reach out to us. We've got a lot of uh, supply partners as well as um, some partnerships with with uh, other firms that we work very closely with that we feel like we can provide a solution to with there. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, another question that we have here, um, gotten this in a couple different forms as well. Uh, I'm a EPC developer. Will you finance projects that my team builds? Or do we need to work with this with uh, Innovatus as the team? So that's to Brilliant Capital, you, Chris. Yeah. So so typically, we will only finance projects that are uh, constructed by Innovatus. Now that that said, uh, depending on the project, we will make some exceptions, and uh, you know, EP, you know, 
the EPC term is pretty broad, right? There's a lot that goes into engineering, procurement, and construction, um, and different EPC firms are more robust in different elements uh, of that total scope. So there have been a couple instances where we have worked with EPC developers where Innovatus has been uh, able to carve out some of that scope and we've made, you know, we're looking at making exceptions. So, you know, maybe we can get a better deal on modules or you know, maybe we have, uh, you know, a better uh, construction management team. So it really is a case by case basis, but generally we, um, you know, a big part of our existence is to, to bring work to Innovatus. So to the extent that we can, we can do that. That's where we'd prefer to deploy our limited amount of capital. Okay. Yeah, Nathan, I think Chris hit the nail on the head. We're, we're certainly open to all different kinds of constructs um, that can work for, for parties. We're uh, at Innovatus, we've been scaling our company over the past few years as the average size of our products continue to grow, um, of our projects continue to grow. We, we, we understand that um, the needs are growing as well in the marketplace. And so uh, we should have the avail availability to, to make most anything work with folks, but Again, that would just be a case by case basis we could talk through. All right, great. Uh, next question I have here: uh, Will you consider churches and nonprofits? Yeah, that's churches a, and nonprofits. Yeah. yeah, churches and nonprofits are are an interesting one. We and the answer the answer to that is yes. Um, they're interesting because uh, you know churches and nonprofits one don't have their own tax. Uh, appetite. So, for those of you on the call who who don't know, you know the primary driver. Well, one of the one of the big incentives for uh, solar financiers is the ability to take you know the investment tax credit, and there is a bonus appreciation element that uh, provides a tax benefit as well. So, churches and nonprofits can't monetize those uh, important elements, but you know churches and nonprofits do buy power from their local utility or municipality. So they can realize uh, the savings associated with, with solar. The other issue is that, uh, you know, typically nonprofits aren't necessarily, uh, I guess, evaluating the credit of a church or a nonprofit is sometimes more challenging. But, you know, all that being said, it, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we're comfortable doing and we have actually looked at uh, several churches in the past. So the answer is yes. Okay, Nathan, one thing I would add, uh, just depending on the background of the folks that are um, joining us today, we at Innovatus have a, a research department that I mentioned before that has in-depth knowledge on state to state um, regulations on how we can structure financing um, because it is it does vary from state to state. And so if you have a question about whether or not um, where you are at, you're allowed to have a power purchase agreement or things like that, feel free to reach out. We can we can walk through that and, and talk about the structures that need to be in place to accomplish those goals. Great, thanks guys. Uh, next question here, what deliverables do you need to start the process of assessing a project? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the some of the basic questions, and we we covered a little bit of this, is who generally do we think the off taker would be, um, and then we can start going through the list of you know what type of array is this going to be, uh, all of those different subsets, so that we can start piecing together whether or not it's feasible to actually build the pro project, and then at the same time, um, some of the questions that we'd ask of that off taker are what are their goals financially from a, a weight of power that they're buying so that we can start assessing the background of how feasible it is to work through this. And so there's a process of Innovatus and Brilliant Capital working together um, through a transparent um, formula of what we think the, the costs might be for an array um, with the kind of what, what's the bogey here? What, what's our target for the rate of power we need to be at so that we can hit this sweet spot of uh, the return on investment for the um, potential client, uh, the IRR for Brilliant Capital and its partners, and for the margin for the EPC firm or Innovatus in this case. Yeah, now, so I would add to that, um, you know, really, if there's a customer that is interested in solar, you don't need that much. You need to 
you know, have an interest in, in solar. And you also need to be able to identify, you know, where you think the array is going to go. So, you know, do you have roof space, uh, any information on the roof? Uh, do you have land set aside uh, for, uh, for the array? And then, yeah, as Danny mentioned, you know, to run the economic analysis to see if it will save you, save you money. We, you know, it's nice to have, uh, you know, you know, 12, you know, 12 months worth of utility bills or, you know, for larger entities, uh, some sense of, you know, the, the, uh, the avoided cost or, or what, what you're currently paying for power. And then we can do an assessment that will inform you, you know, will we be able to save you money on a, you know, per kilowatt hour basis, or does it make sense for, for the customer to buy the, you know, buy and own the facility themselves? All right. Thanks guys. Uh, moving on to the next question here. Is there a geographical focus or will you finance project projects throughout the country? No, we're, um, we're open to, to uh, looking at projects throughout the country. Now that's, that said, um, you know, we are very, um, you know, as Danny mentioned, we do have a research team at Innovatus and we have, you know, our own internal market assessment, uh, you know, of the different states. And, you know, as you all know, there are different incentives in different states. And, um, you know, our view is that the, a lot of the growth in the solar industry will be within, you know, the Midwestern states, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, um so that you know those those are in our backyard so that you know it's easy for us to you know to generate deal flow from those you know four or five states but um you know we we've you know innovators has worked you know throughout the country um and brilliant capital is is really agnostic to to location as long as it's in the u.s great all right thanks guys uh next question here uh, will Brilliant Capital and Innovative Solar work with aggregators to implement projects under FERC Order 2222? Similarly, will you work on virtual PPA projects? Um, and I can answer the first part here, guys. Um, so we can work towards the FERC 2222 point, uh, but it will have to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. So the rule is basically saying, you know, one to 10 megawatts will be treated as large scale projects in the wholesale market. Uh, so we will and, and are willing to work towards that. Uh, we'll just have to review it on a case by case basis. See, it helps when the moderator is smarter than the speakers. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to punt on that, that answer. <laughs> well, and, and in terms of virtual PPAs, we, we will do that as well. Um, Okay. Yeah, no, just kind of broadly from Innovatus' standpoint with targeting, um, again, yeah, the Midwest has certainly um, shown that the marketplace is growing and that there's a lot going on there. But that being said, we've done work from coast to coast and even in the Caribbean um, with a, a storage plus solar project there. Um, and so, you know, really what we're trying to do is, is continue to build relationships with folks and have uh, a repeatable process to bring value in quality to the marketplace. So if, if there are projects that, that make sense for, for all parties, we certainly want to talk through that. Um, that being said, we found ourselves to be extremely active in Illinois, Indiana, um, Ohio, and Michigan lately. And so, um, you know, we're, we're excited about those developments, but certainly don't want anyone to get the, uh, the feel that we would say no to opportunities outside of that. And the structures itself to, to implement those solutions, we'd be open to as well. Great. Next question here. Uh, in the states you've operated in, what have been the best state programs from a developer's perspective? Well, recently we've done quite a bit of work um, partnering with some folks in the Illinois um, SREC market. And so, you know, the, the states that have um, shown to, to have productive SREC markets certainly have another lever that can be pulled in that financial matrix and make it that much easier to bring value to the off taker and um, you know, the EPC firm just to make things work. So um, you know, that dynamic of talking through how to value those SRECs and how to plan the value of those SRECs 
um, into the future is certainly something that Chris spends a lot of time on and, and um, we, we feel like can, can bring value to that process. Um, so, you know, we have um, been active in, in bidding projects throughout the Midwest, but also um, recently on, on the coast uh, and certainly the SREC market can, can drive some of that. Um, Chris, don't mean to, to steal your thunder when it comes to the formula itself, if you want to speak to it, but from, uh, from our development side, we've certainly been active looking at how the SREC markets are um, changing and evolving. And um, there's been a lot of volatility as well. Obviously, we, we've all kind of seen what's going on in Ohio recently, and we're looking forward to seeing what decisions are made there in the future. Yeah, no, I, I think that, um, you know, that's really what makes the, the job and the industry so interesting and enjoyable is that it's, uh, it's constantly changing. So if you would ask that question, you know, four years ago, we would have said, you know, North Carolina and, and maybe, maybe Georgia. Um, and now Danny's right. We've seen a lot of activity in Illinois, the New York, um, the New York program is also very strong. And uh, like I mentioned, we're, you know, we're pretty bullish on our backyard. So at some point the Michigan market will really take off. Uh, we're seeing a lot of coal plant retirements and nuclear plant retirements in Indiana. So something's got to fill that uh, capacity and all indications are that, you know, the, the state government is, you know, going to, you know, uh, you know, at least not stand in the way of solar filling that gap. So, um, you know, ask us again in six months and we, we may have a different answer for you. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I do agree um, with Danny. I think that, um, you know, part of part of what we spend every week doing is staying on top of the market and uh, and trying to figure out where the next uh, the next place to spend our efforts will be. Great. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, another question here. Um, we have covered it a little, but uh, what do you consider your sweet spots in system size? I believe. Sure, I can speak to that first. So we, uh, you know, it's, it's been evolving. Um, you know, the average size of the projects we've done this year is somewhere around um, six to 10 megawatts. Um, but again, I, I wouldn't want to shortchange in the opportunities on, on projects that may look to be smaller than that. And certainly we have uh, a lot of efforts going on right now um, to try to provide a solution to the utility market that, that's come about in Indiana. Um, we've got a very productive partnership that's ongoing right now with some developments that we're excited about um, to try to, to be a factor in playing into the roles that Chris was just talking about with um, coal being shut down and, uh, you know, that capacity needing to be filled. Um, you know, we're, we're active in that market as well. So um, right now, the sweet spot might be two to 20 megawatts. Um, I think we'll always have a certain subset of innovators that will be executing projects at that level. Um, but we're looking to, to continue to transform our company to, to answer to that larger utility scale um, size of projects and are excited about our, our ability to, to possibly even double um, or triple the amount of megawatts we've delivered to the marketplace in the next three to five years. Yeah, for, for Brilliant Capital, the answer is a little bit complicated. So for projects that are ready for construction, I would say our sweet spot for projects that you know we would own internally is is two to five megawatts. That said, you know our motivation is to help bring uh, projects to Innovatus. So, and you know we also are very confident in our relationship with um, with our financial partners, and we we feel like we can add a lot of value for them as well by by uh, you know providing financial support and also by bringing innovators. So we, you know, we'll look at projects up to, you know, 200 megawatts. Um, on the development side, I think the answer is, is also similar, right? So we are interested in deploying capital into, into projects that will, that are, you know, really good projects. It's really the quality of the project more than the size of the project that's important on that end. All right, thanks guys. Uh, just a couple more questions coming in here. Um, would you consider partially prepaid bought down scenarios? I think partially baked projects. Uh, yeah, yeah, again, it just depends on, on the fit. You know, we're, we're really just trying to solve the equation for, um, 
you know, the hitting goals of profitability for each party. So as long as um, we can make sure that we have the proper resources involved to, to vet and mitigate risk and have uh, a financial outcome that's positive for all entities, we're, we're happy to talk through um, ways to partner. Um, and I'm sure uh, Chris can speak to Brilliant Capital's um, ability to continue to fund projects that might be on their way as well. I didn't quite understand the question, Nathan. Um, I, I think uh, Danny did a good job answering it, but it, it was, would you consider partially prepaid bought down scenarios? So um, maybe you're already into the development stages and- Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I have nothing to add. Danny, Danny did cover that very well. <laughs> okay, um, next question here. Uh, we've got two more. This one is thoughts about SREX um, as an incentive. Yeah, so yeah, we, we so, talked a little bit about it a few minutes ago. No, go ahead, Chris. I didn't mean to jump in there. No, uh, I was just going to note that, you know, from a financing perspective, um, you know, SREX are a little bit tricky, right? So generally, depending on the state, you can kind of lock in your SREX revenue for three years. Um, I don't think there are many states where the market is that liquid where you can go out further than three years. So when we're looking at the economics of a project, you know, we'll give full, you know, full values of the first three years worth of SREX. Once you get out into the tail, it's harder for us to rely on that revenue to achieve our return. So, you know, depending on the state, we, we do put some discount on, um, you know, on the, on the SREX value. And there are certain states where we have our own view, um, but typically we'll rely on, uh, you know, third parties or, or uh, independent consultants to give us their view on where they think the market is going and, and we'll discount the value um, appropriately. But it is, it, is, um, it is a complicating element, but also an element that, that uh, you know, makes projects work that, that wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, that, and that's the only point I would echo that Chris made there is just um, we continually look to third parties to kind of reassure and, and make sure we do our diligence on those market um, fluctuations and how we can value that both from an innovative perspective um, because that affects our targeting in the marketplace as well as um, what Chris has mentioned. Great, thanks. And then uh, last question here uh, to both of you. Um, I'll start with Danny. Danny, in your opinion, what is the single most challenging speed bump to uh, developing a solar project? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Um, there is a financing aspect to, to all of this. And so, um, you know, development in, in some respects could can act a little bit like the Wild West in that you, you might have a good idea of where um, could be a great place to start with a, a potential interested um, partner. Uh, and I, part, from a partner standpoint, I mean a potential uh, client. And uh, all throughout the process, you're trying to kind of check boxes and mitigate that risk. And so it, it kind of depends on the size of the project you're looking at. Um, but there are financial risks that need to be addressed um, throughout all of that. And I think if you can get all of the information coming from one source, it helps you sort through those risks. So if you are partnering with someone, um, and we feel we do this well, that has tentacles in each part of the process, whether that be the, the land development process with us partnering with local leaders on, on the ground, or if it's us having good strong contacts from an engineering perspective that can look into things like interconnection costs. Because if you don't do your diligence, you can think, you could be at the five yard line and think that you've got a project ready to go and you know costs can spike up that will eat away all of your margin um, at, at the very last second. And that can be very frustrating. So I don't know that I have one in particular that I would pinpoint. Um, each project is different, but I would say that it's really important to have um, a transparent conversation about all of the checklist that needs to be addressed and be able to rely on the person or the people that you're working with to be experts to know uh, what to look into, especially if this is the first time or second time you're actually doing this. 
um, you know, all of those factors can, can certainly lead to issues if you don't have someone that has their eye on the ball and can do the proper diligence. Great, thanks, Danny. Uh, Chris, similar question to you. In your opinion, what is the single most challenging speed bump to financing a solar project? Yeah, it, it is a good question. Um, you know, in my view, you know, a good financing experience is a function of how well organized everything is and how well all the parties are communicating. So it really is, a, it really is those two elements combined. So if you think about project financing, and I, I used the, you know, I used the term earlier and I apologize for using it again, but it really is like herding cats, right? So you've got, you know, maybe five or six stakeholders that all need to be uh, on the on the same page, right? And you start at kind of a very broad level, making sure that everyone is comfortable with the project and where it's going to sit, you know, how it's going to produce power, you know, how it's going to be permitted, how the power is going to be sold, what will happen at the end of the, of the project life. So you start at a very high level and, you know, get the community involved, the customer, you know, the, the EPC firm, the financing firm, uh, you know, the federal authorities that are going to, you know, provide the federal permits, the local authorities that are providing the local permits. Um, and I'm probably missing five or six other stakeholders. So at, at, at the very core of project financing is organizing all of those interested parties, to be sure they're on the same page at every step of the process, right? So we talked earlier about the, you know, project development life cycle. So you start early. If everyone's on the same page and they agree on how the project should work and you move down the life cycle towards the later stage activities and throughout that entire process it's very important to be sure that you know both everyone understands you know what's going on and two that everyone's on board with how the project is uh is developing and that continues through the construction and the operation of the facility and that's why we place such an emphasis on um, you know, communicating with the uh, with the local community and the local authorities, um, and we place such an emphasis on maintaining strong relationships with all the all the parties involved. And then, you know, I know I'm giving a little bit of a long-winded answer, but along with making sure all the the uh, stakeholders are happy, you also need to be sure that you know everything is is lined up right. So all the contracts are. Uh, are correct and in order, all the permits are in place. Um, and that requires, you know, a very organized uh, attention to detail, uh, you know, packet. And so staying on top of that uh, really does make the experience a lot, a lot easier because no matter what you do, no matter how organized you are, there are going to be surprises and um, along the way. And to the extent that you're well organized and communicating effectively with the other interested parties, um, it makes things go a lot smoother. Yeah, Nathan, one, one other point. Uh, in the same way that the SREC market can, can certainly add value to the financial matrix, um, I think the more bifurcated your partners are in bringing a, a project together, you, you could be adding layers of, of, um, of costs in, in that. And so you know, one of the things that, that we feel like we can do um, to streamline, and we mentioned this on a, a few different ways, with, with the partnership that Burning Capital and Innovatus has, we should be able to cut out some of those layers and, and help folks to maintain um, as much value as possible in that project. So, um, you know, it's, again, the, our secret sauce, I think, has a lot to do with communication and diligence and an ability to work through things all under the same roof. Great. Well, thanks guys. That's all the questions that we had here. Um, Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Chris. I wanted to remind everybody, if you do have a question or one pops up, feel free to email Danny or Chris or reach out to Innovatus generally. Um, thank you all for joining the Innovatus Solar webinar series, Investing in Your Energy Future. Today's topic of how to smooth over speed bumps of solar financing. Uh, thanks again, all, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate you joining.